Oh, I bet Tink you wants to be with me all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tink babysitting time now. <laughs> he he's he so doesn't cute. have the taste. He just he knows I have things oh, that taste like good. Tink made it onto Facebook, just for the hand. And we there. I see that. That's the door. Oh, that's so okay. Cute. Yes. Well, welcome Facebook. We're glad to have you join us. The folks on Periscope have gotten a little extra a bit of our entertainment for the evening. Uh, so the question we've been asking over on Periscope, we'll give you Facebook people a shot at it too, uh, is what is unique and special about the KFC Twitter account? And for those of us who are, those of you who are just joining who may not know us, uh, my name is Kathleen Sinnott. And that's- And I'm Marianne Morrison, right? And together we run the BA Zone, which is a resource for all of you fine folks out there like us who are struggling to turn out the very best requirements you possibly can. And tonight we're gonna be talking about using document analysis and shadowing as part of your requirements gathering process. Okay, oh, there we go. Now, why is my chat window popping up here? No, I really don't want to chat right now. That's really not a good time. <laughs> we can do that later. Okay. And we seem to have sound and video everywhere, so we're ahead of the game already. Wow. Hey, I'll take the wins where we get them. Four shows in and we're getting, it got it down like Pat. <laughs> Don't jinx us. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I know how that goes. And boom, everything goes. <laughs> That's right. I kept waiting to see today whether or not we were going to lose power. I kept checking in from the office. It's like, is everything on? Okay, good. Is everything on? Okay, good. I know. There's no. a lot of Jersey that doesn't have power right now. Oh, is that right? I didn't know yeah. That. I know we had a lot of seems to be in central and south, but you know, with our luck, it would be now. Well, it was supposed to be around 8, 8.30, but I don't know, maybe it's past this by, skipped over us. That would be nice. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to see a skeleton a of going by. In like 15 minute periods. It was like, it was fine. And then right. the skies would open and then it would calm down for a while and then we'd do it again. But we needed it. Though. We hadn't had water in a while. All righty. So I don't have anything with a clock on it. Here we go. Uh, let me get this out of the way. Let's see if we can get that timer up. Let's really push our luck. That's not the one. There we go. That's the one. So what time is it? It's... 8.48. Okay, I set it for five minutes and it starts a five minute counter. Let's try that again. I really need to get a quiet keyboard. All right, so evidently it's only gonna do five minutes, so we'll have to wait. Oh, that's why. Sense. Are you dressing up this year, Kathleen, to hand out candy? No, I don't usually bother dressing up. I leave that to the kids. I'm usually too, like, hot because I'm running around trying to get all of the uh, candy and get all the people taken care of. There we we just sit outside now. Do you guys dress up? No, we dress the dog up. <laughs> does he like that, or does? And then we, we set the because we get thirty kids at a clip. We get about five hundred kids that come here, so we just sit on the porch, and just it's like sort of a machine dropping candy in, you know. So, but it's yeah. great. It's great. Yeah, pretty much what we do, except that I do it in the breezeway because that way I put the fencing up so he can see them and they can see him, but I don't have to worry about him running off or. Every so often you get a kid who's afraid of dogs, so it takes the fear away. Um, but mm -hmm. I also like to let them come up and, like, so especially the really little ones, ring the doorbell because that's, like, part of the whole thing. The first time you go up and ring the doorbell, like, it's a big deal. Last year I had one 
was you know coming around the corner and i just finished a crowd i hadn't had time to close the door yet and uh he comes around he goes mama the door is already open <laughs> i'm like i'll close it i'll close it it's okay <laughs> you gotta have his moment exactly he, he clearly had been working up for this probably for days and he was gonna do it and she was so funny she was apologizing i'm like oh, don't apologize that's the fun part all right, so well, I'm going to give you the pseudo uh, trivia question one more time, then we'll answer it and give you the real one. So the question today is, what is special and unique about the KFC Twitter account? You know, now I want to know because I don't know either. Okay. It was on all I'm the waiting. tech news. I don't know if it's made it to the mainstream news yet. They're usually a couple of days behind. But it, I, it cracked me up. As soon as I was like, like, it's one of those things where you're like, of course. But yeah, somebody had to think of it. Somebody had to do it. Okay. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I don't know what. Let me try that. No, that's okay. That's there. Got that. I guess we're good. Seriously? No, 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 no. <laughs> Somebody's trying to call me on Hangouts. Not now. No calls on Hangout during showtime. Because I'm popular. It's probably something to do with politics or robocalls. Hmm. All right, so I'm going to answer the pseudo question, which was, what is special and unique about the KFC Twitter account? And the answer is that they're only following 11 people. Do you want to guess why or who they're following? No? Okay. So they're following all five of the Spice Girls. And they're fo following six guys named Herb or Herb, depending on how you say it. So it's <laughs> 11 herbs and spices. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I heard you, Sue. <laughs> oh, but come on, I mean, it's yes, it, it's kind of punish, but it's a stroke of genius because they've got everybody talking about it, and they were very careful oh too. God. They made sure that like the herbs, the her herbs that they were following were certified accounts with nothing nasty going on. They were very careful about how they did it, but I just thought that was brilliant. <laughs> that is great. Somebody needs a raise there. Right, exactly. Somebody had a brainstorm that day. They had to have their Wheaties and their coffee that morning. <laughs> All right, you want me to bring up the pups and you can ask a real trivia question? Why, sure. Okay, let me bring the pups up. There they it's are. time for this week's trivia question brought to you by Murphy and Tinker. There they are. Well, Murphy's a little, you saw Tinker and we haven't seen Murphy today. But uh, the question of the week is, what was John Wayne, that's John Wayne the actor, what was John Wayne's original name, the movie actor? This is going back a ways now, John Wayne. And well, I'll tell you, Pilgrim, but you're going to have to wait till the end of the show. Well, c considering our history, maybe we yeah. should do it at the end of the pre-show, because we tend to forget by the yeah. end of the show. <laughs> well, that's true. Do it at the end of the pre-show. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. John Wayne. Oh, Hardly ever sense. kissed a woman. <laughs> Just a lot of horses. Yeah. Well, you know, they were out on the, the Wild West there. Nobody asked any questions. Uh, there you go. There, there's Murphy singing for us in the background. Okay, so for you folks who are just joining us, we are in the pre-show part of the show. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, using document anal <laughs> analyzing documents and shadowing as part of your requirements gathering. Uh, so we're just kind of getting everything ready, giving everybody a chance to get settled in. Uh, we ask that you follow and or you know share this with uh, people. If you follow, then you'll get notified about when we go live. Uh, we're on Periscope and we're on Facebook. Um, and if you share, that's sharing the love, and we all appreciate that. We also take hearts and thumbs up and that kind of stuff, too, you know. We're, we're not picky. I don't know what's going on out there, but he is just having a little fit right now. 
kind of late. I can't hear him, so. Oh, oh, well, that's good. I did try something with the microphone, so we'll see if that helps. Trying to block out, like, every time the air conditioner kicks on, the fan from the computer. Indian noise. So far, so good. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a gun uh, shy after last week. Oh, you're all right. Okay. And refresh. Oh, I, you know, all the screens are working. That's good. I don't know what's wrong. My, um, I've got that uh, Android tablet. The it's, it's like a Chromebook. It is a Chromebook. Um, it wouldn't power up. I can't wait to go figure out what's wrong with that. Oh, is that the thing I saw almost go sailing past your head when you threw it? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I like that because it, it's lower profile. Like I can lay it almost flat, but at an angle so I can read it. I don't know what, all of a sudden it just wasn't cooperating and I didn't have time to mm. deal with it. No, when technology fights back, I don't play that. Yeah, pull the power and you go. teach it who's boss. <laughs> Ooh, he's so, he's so hard. Yeah, let's look at the puppies again. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can never get enough of the puppies. Nah, they're just adorable. Actually, did I tell you I almost rescued a dog? It was like yesterday coming home. This was uh -oh. the thing. I came home. I, I, there's a couple different ways I come home depending on traffic. Uh, so this was kind of like, you know, plan C because it was a bad day on the highway. And I made an extra turn that I don't all, normally make. I don't know why I did it. But as I made it, there was a little, it looked like maybe a Pomeranian tearing up the street. Really? And I'm looking around for his people. Don't see anybody. So I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, do the U-turn, start to go back. And I see two kids come by on a bike. I'm like, oh, maybe he belongs to them. So, you know, wait a second. And he went right past them. I'm like, shoot. So I, went, I parked the car and I get out and I'm trying to get him to come to me. Usually dogs will come to me. And he was just barking his head off and moving away. So I called out to the kids. I'm like, is he yours? And they're like, nope, but this is not good. I'm like, I agree. So I sent them to go knocking on doors while I just tried to keep him from running out in traffic because he kept running out in the middle of the road. Ooh, Long story short, good. about the fifth door they knocked on, it was his house. They had no idea he'd gotten out. Lady comes tearing around the corner. It was adorable. He went running over and leapt into her arms. It was just, Aww. it was exactly how you want that kind of a thing out. to end. But, you know, he was he freaking out himself. And he's going to end up, you know, road pizza because oh he's dashing gosh. in front of cars. He's running up to every door. Are you my mother? Are you my mother? <laughs> well, that was okay. the thing, you know, because... I've, I've run into this before. It actually happened on the busy road near my house. And the dog would not come up to me, wouldn't take treats, nothing. So just sort of, I was running out of ideas. I didn't know what to do. So I'm like, okay, you know, show me home. And darned if he didn't turn around and walk up to a house and go up the stairs. And I'm like, okay, let's find out if this is home. But he wouldn't let me go on the stairs. With him. So I had to take a stick and ring the doorbell. And sure enough, it was his house. You know, and it's no. like, you know, instead of saying thank you or something, she's just like, oh, lets him in and slams the door. I'm like, okay, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. We seem to go through <coughs> cycles of this. All right. Finding That's critters. Second count. I'm going to take this off. Okay. Will you be opening or am I opening? You can do it. Okay. Just checking. We're winging it. You called it, you get it. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the BA Zone Live. Uh, in tonight's show, we're going to take a deep dive into document analysis and uh, shadowing, two of the top uh, 10 requirements gathering and elicit uh, elicitation techniques that we talked about last week. Um, we've got a lot to discuss. And if you like uh, what you hear, please let us know in the comments or, you know, give us a thumbs up as Kathleen said, or hearts. Um, and uh, just in case you didn't uh, hear it before, I'm Marianne Morrison and Kathleen Sinnott is my co-founder. There she is. She's on the other side there. And together we are the founders of the BA Zone and she's dancing away. Uh, we created the BA Zone to help everyone who creates and maintains business and technical requirements. Um, and this is all for you. So be sure to let us know what you would like to see in upcoming episodes. And we'd be happy to set that up for you. 
Okay, everyone comfortable? Let's get started uh, with okay, how to use... Ask the what? trivia question and then give them a minute and then give them the answer for the people who are just joining now. Oh, you want to... Okay. Uh, the trivia question for this week again is the movie actor John Wayne. What was his original name? Not his stage name. He does have a real name. Uh, that is the trivia question. And uh, that's what we asked earlier on. And just to get that out of the way, I'm going to answer that right now. His name was Marion Morrison. And that's absolutely no relation to me whatsoever. Although we did have a great grandfather who went out for a loaf of bread and disappeared for 20 years and came back without the loaf of bread. So we don't know what he did out on the Barbary Coast. So we actually may be related to uh, John Wayne. <laughs> Marion Morrison, not sure, uh, but that's uh, this week's trivia question. So uh, let's get back to, um, we did introduce ourselves. Family history, do you? I do not know, and I, I don't, I'm afraid to spit in that little test tube and find out, actually. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Things are better <laughs> off, left unknown. I know. All right. So, uh, so if you're just start, if you're just coming in, I'm Marianne Morrison. That's Kathleen Sinnott, and uh, like I said, we're the founders of the BA Zone. Tonight we're going to be talking about document analysis and shadowing. So everybody get comfortable, and let's just get started with the presentation. We got a lot to cover. So first off, uh, document analysis. We'll just give you a, a definition again. Uh, is the study of existing documentation in order to extract information requirements that are relevant to a current project. Uh, this is, I can't stress how important this step is to make you, especially if you're a new business analyst, to make it look like you know what you're talking about. Um, and in, in any case, doing this analysis, you do not want to skip this step. It's uh, really important to get all this information. Very often where you are going to find out things that you wouldn't find out any other way. Any other way. Um, when do you want to use document analysis? Uh, you can use it when you're replacing one or more existing systems with a new one. Uh, if you're a brandy new uh, to the business or a new BA or you're uh, in a new project that's already begun. And uh, we did this one a lot when you're migrating a product or a service uh, from multiple uh, places into one single application or a suite of products. Um, the companies that we've worked for in the past, it seemed like it was their mission to get to number one by acquiring number two, number three, number four, you know, all the other companies. And uh, we did a lot of this migrating and picking the best in breed from each product um, in order to make, you know, a super product. So it's uh, really important when you're migrating to do this document analysis. Um, also, when users or stakeholders are not available, or when you're prior to interviewing those users or stakeholders, you want to go in, you know, knowing what you're talking about, so you don't waste those users, uh, their time, uh, or the stakeholders. Uh, their time is pretty valuable, so you want to make sure you have a lot of information up front, so you know you're not making them repeat something they may have repeated to a project manager and or someone else, and that gets pretty frustrating. And um, of course you want to do it when documentation exists. Now, a lot of times there may not be business analyst documentation, but they're usually, if they've been in business for any period of time, there's usually some type of information, even if that might be uh, memos, uh, you know, or um, some type of advertising or marketing that they might've done. You can usually find something even in lieu of uh, business analyst uh, stuff. Yeah, and again, it's um, really important to have read all this stuff because if you're just relying on people's memory, you know, we're all human and we're all fallible. So it's really good if you have go into your conversations, your interviews, your shadowing with this information already in your brain as much as possible because then when they say something that doesn't line up with something that you read, you can ask the question, okay, well, I saw, you know, in someplace else that, you know, this was the case, but now you're saying this. So was there a change that wasn't documented? And you can start to dive in and get those details, which could be very important and could make the difference between your project being successful or breaking um, other parts of the system. Right. Why do you want to use uh, this document analysis? 
document analysis is going to provide you with current or near current state of existing systems. And I say near current state because, you know, a lot of this documentation is notoriously out of date. It might be slightly out of date. It might be really out of date. So you got to keep that in mind um, that this information is really good as a starting point. But, you know, as Kathleen said, you're going to need to confirm this uh, and or update it during uh, your interview techniques, you know, your other techniques. But it's a great starting point. Um, and again, it's, it ensures that you're not starting with a blank page. So it's going to give you a timeline, a roadmap of any previous implementations or potential acquisitions that have occurred. Um, so you get an idea of you, you may not want to present a possible solution later on that may have been tried already. So it gives you a lot of that information so you're not going in knowing nothing. Um, it is also a great way to be unobtrusive uh, and you can do it alone. So you're not bothering people. You're getting a lot of this information up front. It does take a little bit of legwork, um, but it's important to do that. And it's going to complement other techniques and it can be used to initiate or verify any information you're getting. And it's also going to give you a certain level of confidence uh, and efficiency when you're going into these meetings and engaging with stakeholders. You know, at least knowing what you're, you're talking about or having a good base information uh, is going to make you seem more professional and you're going to be able to ask the right questions also. Um, so how do we do this document analysis? Um, we can take it in a couple of, I think, uh, three steps. There are many approaches to doing this. Um, and this is just one of the approaches. And we like to start with sort of the high level external view of the company, uh, because that tends to organize the information, uh, products and services, into nice chunks of information that are at a higher level, and then work your way down uh, to the more detailed and specific information. So at the higher level, you want to look from the external, the customer or the client view. That could be potential clients that you're marketing to or your actual clients. And some of the things you want to think about are what does the customer or client see and, and what are the products or services? How are they integrated? How are they being marketed? Who's the target audience? Um, and you can get that information from websites, advertising, promotional materials, sales toolkits, um, and requests for information or uh, request for proposals. A request for information is pretty much just a standard uh, business document and it's used to gather information from different organizations in order for a company to compare those organizations if they're going to buy their products or their services. And what uh, usually happens is a, the, a lot of RFIs will come in from these companies and you'll call them down and so there's a lot of information in those requests for information, a tremendous amount uh, that the companies, uh, you know, um, hand over. And uh, that leads to that request for proposal. Typically, when they call down that list, they'll send out the company who's looking to purchase those services. Uh, will send out a request for proposal to a smaller targeted group of who they sent the RFI out to. And again, that request for proposal has a tremendous amount of information uh, from your company. And hopefully they keep it in a one area where you can find it, but you can always find one laying around if they've sent it out for their services. It has a tremendous amount of information, um, you know, and uh, typically with the RFP, once somebody selects one just to finish that process out, uh, then those uh, that company will come in and do a presentation, whether, you know, a couple of them will come in and then you can pick one, but that's an RFI and an RFP. And they, they're great for information if the company's ever put one out there. So step two would be to take a look at the operational um, delivery of the products or services. Um, this is where you start looking on people's desks for, uh, for any type of procedural manuals. You look online, uh, there could be things in SharePoint if they use SharePoint. Uh, but this is basically how the company uh, delivers its services. And you can find that in their policies and procedures, uh, their training manuals, their process documentation. You can find it hanging off of cubicle walls. You can find them in operational manuals. Uh, org charts will give you roles and responsibilities, you know, that type of information. And even operational 
form letters, notifications, fulfillments, um, they all have a lot of data that is input into the system. Um, and that data can help you identify business rules, data elements. Uh, you can get a lot of information from those forms and letters as well. And, uh, you know, we've been through a lot of these acquisitions, actually. And, and sometimes uh, those folks are not friendly about handing over information when you acquire another company. So it uh, really comes in handy when you sort of put on your, uh, you know, your uh, little uh, magnifying glass and try to find stuff in the office. Step three, uh, you want to take a look at the technical delivery and support of the product services or process. And um, that's sort of like, you know, what systems or applications does the company have to support the delivery of the products or processes? What information are they collecting? What are the inputs, the outputs, key features, et cetera? And you can find a lot of that information if it exists in computer software training manuals and videos. Um, if there's any previous documentation from a business analyst, an architect, uh, technical specs, um, any type of um, web design documents, um, that's great. You know, if it's there, uh, some of it may be out of date, but at least it gives you a good basis of information. You could also look into the client service level agreements. If, if you've licensed for a service with a particular client, a lot of times they sign these SLAs, which are service level agreements. And they'll, those SLAs will say, you know, uh, something must be, they're basically rules, something must be done in this period of time, or, you know, we might not pay you this much or that much. And there, there are level of rule sets, uh, turnaround times for different types of things. Um, and there's a lot of business rule information you can find in those if, if they do exist. Um, also, if there's any type of government or agency rules, you know, we worked in healthcare uh, for many years and you have HIPAA uh, guidelines and, um, or if you work in the communications, there might be FCC rules. And a lot of times the company that you work for needs to abide by those rules. So again, those become business rules that become part of your document analysis. Also a great place if you have uh, formal QA or even users who QA the system, uh, they typically might have test plans and test plans will walk through an application, you know, to make sure it's working. So there's a lot of information in test plans and user acceptance plans, which are usually, you know, not as detailed um, as far as a test plan. Um, they do walk through positive and negative paths, but test plans are really looking for a lot more than a user acceptance plan. But again, it's a, it's a great place to get information. And also keep in mind and that if you can get access to any of their support logs. Uh, that's also another great resource to see what kinds of problems people have been having in the past, look for patterns of confusion or general problems. It, sometimes that can be tough to get your hands on, but if you can, it usually turns into a gold mine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, step four uh, is the optimization analysis. And that's where you want to take a look at exactly what Kathleen was talking about, uh, how you can improve the product going forward as a BA. And you're going to want to look at the customer feedback, any type of suggestions and complaints that come in, uh, the system defect reports, uh, the enhancement lists of users or the, you know, the user requests, any type of product roadmaps. You know, a lot of companies have, you know, three, five year, seven, 10 year roadmaps. Uh, sometimes they call them vision documents. And whether, you know, you have, uh, you have met those product roadmaps, they contain a lot of information. Any type of industry uh, best practices, if you're in a, a particular business that um, has a best practices, you want to take a look out there in the industry and see what's going on to see how uh, your product measures up. And uh, any type of competitor uh, product reviews or information, uh, if, you, if you've done a competitor analysis or your marketing department, if there's a marketing department, or you can just go out and, and do one yourself and look online to see what your competitors um, are, are marketing out there to see where there might be a gap in, in what you have. And those are the four steps uh, that we typically follow. Again, going from the big 
uh, broader sense down to the more defined areas. Um, how you want to document these findings or notes as you're going through the process, you know, it's up to you. It's, it's pretty various, but you're going to be going through a lot of different uh, types of documents. And even within one document, you may find a data element. You may find a business rule. You may find an idea for a new feature or something that doesn't work well. Um, so the way I've done it in the past is to create a spreadsheet or a Word document. And you just want to keep information on there as to as you're going along. A, an, you know, a spreadsheet is great because you can sort it um, into all the different, you know, what's it a business rule or is it a, um, a type of action you have to take. And you just want to, some of the information you want to document is where you got the information so you can go back to it if someone asks, you know, and the location where it exists. Um, categorize the, the element that you're looking at. You know, is it a business rule? Is it a glossary item? You know, you want to go along an unfamiliar word, you're going to want to put into a glossary for developers for uh, just to clarify for users. We've had many instances where, um, you know, users... Uh, for example, an open an open patient or an open document. What what does open mean? It might mean different things to different people. So those type of things you want to clarify. If you categorize all this information, you can quickly sort through it uh, to confirm it. Um, you want to give some detail or description information. Um, you also want to note uh, what are your next tax, uh, tasks? What are the steps you want to do? Do you need to confirm this information? Do you um, need to discuss it or present it to someone and you can detail that and give them the information about that. And then you want to say, what is, what was the outcome of that? Um, you know, was that business rule potentially obsolete on this date per this person? Um, so, you know, that's a rule that no longer exists. And, um, you know, whether that, you know, just to keep track of it all, whether the status of that uh, task or action is, is it uh, open pending review or closed? You know, that's just one way to do it. Uh, but when you're going through this many documents, you're finding, like I said, uh, information in multiple places. So this seems to be the easiest way to do it. But I'm sure everyone has a ton of them out there. And if you do have a great idea on how to do that, just leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, now we're going to go into shadowing. Let's Kathleen, you... We'll, we'll take a breath here. Because uh, that's pretty much the, the whole piece that we have on the document analysis. Next, we're going to get into the shadowing. But I wanted to welcome a couple of people that we haven't seen before. So Hassan027, thanks so much for coming by. We appreciate the stopping. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to toss them in. We're very relaxed around here. There's no formal process. Just throw in whenever you feel like it. Um, also, Joey123. <laughs> that's a real easy one. Uh, thank you also for coming. I think you're new. I don't remember seeing your name before. So, so thank you. Appreciate you coming by. All righty. We ready to move on? Need to shake off Absolutely. everything, do a little dance, get grab water. You good? Well, I'm good. I'm good. I'm here All for right. you. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's take the, let's take a look at shadowing. All right. Shadowing otherwise known as observation. Uh, we prefer shadowing. We've been using it for a long time. But uh, shadowing users uh, in action as they perform their tasks and or interact with a product or application or process. So in other words, you are just like a fly on the wall and you are going to carefully observe these real life situations so that you get a better understanding how people complete their tasks, interact with the tools. Um, and this method can uncover the reality of what people really do as opposed to what they say they do. Um, a lot of times folks in shadowing are on their best behavior. So, but it's interesting you pick up a lot of information on it. Why okay. should you do the well, shadowing? Well, hang on one second. So the other thing is too, sometimes they're right. not deliberately telling you something different. They're just so close to it that they don't even realize half the things they're doing anymore. So by sitting there and watching, observing what they're doing, you might pick up on things that it's just such a part of their brain is like breathing to them and so they don't bother to mention it. Okay. That's right. Why do you want to do the shadowing? It's going to give you firsthand knowledge of how that user goes through their day, what occurs during the day while they're interacting with a product or doing a process. It's going to give you a really good understanding of what the users do, 
if you create user stories, it's going to really help you out in that um, area as well. It's also going to tell you how they've adapted. Um, a lot of times when a system is put out there, um, people will do all kinds of things because the system doesn't exactly work the way they thought it was going to work. So they will make adaptions to that and um, and what they don't do. You know, you may think they're doing it a certain way. And actually, when you watch them, they're doing it a completely different way. Um, and it's going to identify issues and problems uh, that are going to surface. And it's also going to provide some opportunities for improvement. Um, you know, you watch enough of these people and you compare them across, uh, you're going to come up with uh, information that you wouldn't normally see. It's going to enable you to also look at the responsiveness of the performance. It's going to, you're going to be able to measure speed. You're going to be able to see how long it takes to complete a task, given all the other things that are occurring around someone at the time. And it's also going to show you the user uh, satisfaction level. Um, you'll be able to take a look at the environmental factors as well. You know, a lot of times people are working on obsolete or older hardware and the person right next to them could have a newer piece of hardware. Um, so you might be able to um, give some input into that sort of hardware, what, what the needs are, um, and as well as the software and interface needs. And it's also going to give you the opportunity uh, to build a cohesive team by involving users and really uh, creating a sense that you care about these users and you're not just the machine uh, saying it needs to be done this way. You're actually going to work with them together. And you know, of course you have to deliver that, but um, it's actually going to help build that team so that when you go back to that user, they're going to be happy to answer your questions in the interview process or other types of techniques that you're going to use. So how do we do this shadowing? Uh, step one, Preparation, like everything else that we do in business analysis, preparation is key so that you go in there, you know, user's time is valuable, you know what you're doing, and you know what you're asking. So if it's available, you want to read the user training manual if there is one so that you have a basic idea of how the system works or worked at the time that the manual was created. Um, then you're going to want to identify some users and you're going to want to ask permission to observe them. And you want different levels of users doing the same task. So you want experienced users, inexperienced. You want people who are really good with technology, folks that may not be good with technology, so that you can see how this works under different um, user conditions. Uh, then you're going to want to send an email to those folks, uh, or better yet, have the supervisor send one to let them know uh, what's going on, um, that you're going to be conducting these uh, sessions and what to expect. And in that email, you want to focus on the system or the process. People get a little nervous when people start watching them. They think um, you are judging them and not the process or the system. So you really want to focus and reiterate that fact that it's all about, you know, making this system work better for them, not, not them working better. It'll help them work better, but, you know, it's, it's not about that part. Um, and you really want to decide what it is you want to focus on during the observation. It may be from the beginning to end of an entire set of tasks, or maybe it's just one task that you want to focus on, uh, but you want to set a beginning and an end um, so that you can uh, get through that pretty quickly, you know, with, and you can do several of them as long as the people have the amount of time to do. And you could also do some cyber shadowing too, um, but that kind of freaks people out a little bit too, which is basically yeah, just watching them from afar on the computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little kind of like spyish, you know, but, um, but you can do that as well. So step two in the shadowing process is to actually observe, um, observe someone. So the way you want to do that is you want to go in, you want to be very friendly, you want to put them at ease right away and remind them that you're there to evaluate the system, not them again. You want to be empathetic. Um, ask them to talk through their thought process out loud. You can watch them quietly at first, but 
you really want them to be verbalizing also what they're doing so that you understand what they're doing. Uh, you want to watch and listen as the users perform their task. You have to take lots and lots of notes. Um, be aware that, as I said before, when you're watching someone work, it may not be, it's pretty close to the way they may work, but it's not really just watching them work because they know you're watching. So they may behave differently. They may be on their best behavior. They may, it's not exactly natural, but try to put them at ease and try to get them as close to natural as possible. And you want to pay attention to what the user is saying when they're speaking in comparison to what they're actually doing, just to see if any red flags turn up. And during the observation, if you can vary the days of the week and the times of the week, um, you know, environment plays a pretty big factor as to whether, uh, you know, how someone's doing their jobs. So on a Monday, it may be quite different from a Wednesday or a Friday. And there may be peak hours during the day where they're busier and or where they're slower. And you want to try to capture all those times if you can, just to see if there's a correlation or a difference um, in that time of day or, or the day itself. Okay. And the one thing Step I three is, here, I'm going to keep driving this one home because this is a big one. When you're shadowing somebody, you want to keep them, you know, want to make them feel at ease and all that, but you want to keep reminding them to talk out loud as much as possible. It feels really weird for everybody and you need to acknowledge that for them. Uh, but the more that they think out loud and you can hear how they're thinking about what they're going to do and why they're doing it, the better the information you get. Um, but you're going to have to remind them of that gently a few times. Right. Absolutely. And you want to try to keep them on track, too, because sometimes that talking, they might get a little off track and, you know, just gently say that we can revisit that during the interview process if they're going way off track or getting really, you know, crazy or nutty about something. <laughs> Well, it actually, to um, that point, um, I've just got a little tiny story. Um, when you're doing this, you're, they're going to feel uncomfortable. They're going to be very aware of you at first. But then as time goes on, you know, as you make them feel more comfortable, you're going to just become part of the wallpaper for them. And that's exactly what you want, because that's when you're going to see the best example of what they're doing. However, don't be surprised if they get so comfortable that they maybe start getting into um, things that you didn't want to know. So case in point, I was working on a project a while ago. I'm not going to identify who it was. Um, I was doing a series of these because there were a lot of different departments that were using the tool that we were working on. Um, so I spent several weeks in different departments working on things. And people got so used to seeing me that they kind of forgot that maybe they shouldn't be bad-mouthing their boss or that kind of thing. But <laughs> the one that really drove it home for me, she was way comfortable. She started talking to, I'm assuming, her boyfriend about things that I did not want to know. <laughs> It was a level of detail that, frankly, was just a little too much TMI. Um, so, you know, obviously this was not a situation that I could interrupt or control. So I tried to at least visually remove myself from the situation as much as I could. I turned my back. I may believe I was writing notes and all of that. And I tried really hard to not sigh relief. Um, when she got off the phone and got back to work. So you do need to prepare for anything. You need to stay, you know, very blank about it. Don't react, no matter what it is that you hear. Life is funny. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen, for that Fifty Shades of Grey interlude. <laughs> <laughs> and I know what you're talking about. It definitely happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. So documentation uh, process for shadowing um, is basically taking and uh, reviewing and expanding all of the notes that you've taken during the observation, um, diagramming things like workflows, et cetera. Um, as far as the note goes, you want to uh, note the time it takes to complete a task or, or any system performance issues. Um, as Kathleen was saying, patterns and variations uh, or modifications in the process of the approach uh, between different users, uh, workarounds the users have created because the system doesn't meet their needs, um, uh, user confusion, uh, like we were saying with the defects in the system and enhancements there, 
they're just quite not quite understanding how the system works. The system may be functioning the way it's supposed to, but uh, the users think it's broken because there's some confusion there. Um, you're going to want to uh, look for any information that they're looking through in binders or on sticky notes. Um, I can tell you that a story that I was shadowing someone uh, for a client um, and they were telephone folks and they were engaging. They were part of an engagement team and they would call up a, a someone on the phone and they'd get them on the phone and they'd ask them where they work and based on where they work, this poor girl on the phone, who was timed by the way, um, had to pull out a binder and go to a particular script and read it from the binder. Um, so we know that that information in binders, uh, we later actually made a script on the system. So they followed the script. They wanted them to follow it to the T. Uh, these were not, you know, any type of professional folks. So that information that you see in binders or on sticky notes or anything a user is using within their environment, you want to make sure you note that, take a photo of it, ask the user about it, and uh, find out why it's not actually in the system. Um, you want to also look at where users might be copying or re-entering information outside of the tool or the process. We've had many times where people were doing a process and stopped to type it over on an Excel spreadsheet because they did not trust that the system would save the information. Now that's really bad and that's an extreme thing, but these are some of the things people do and we have to find out why they're doing them. So you want to take a look at any of that type of behavior and document it. Um, and that's pretty much it for the, for the documentation side. Uh, there's tons of other things you can go into. Um, the next step would be to analyze the analysis of all of this information. And again, when you're doing that, you're, this is sort of the fun part. You're looking for patterns across all of these sessions. You're compiling all the details of all the workarounds you've noticed. You're listing out information the users recorded on crib sheets uh, or um, cheat sheets, what they're looking at. You're looking you to catalog any of the pain points that you witnessed, you know, parts of the system where the the user's just throwing up their hands or they're, they're actually saying this should be this way or better. Um, and then you're going to compare the, the results or data to the existing project plans that are out there to identify any gaps. You know, um, typically systems aren't static. People are working on them all the time and coming up with improvements and just make sure, you know, these improvements are there going forward um, or if there's a gap in that. And you're going to want to note any surprises, not the conversation, not the Fifty Shades of Grey conversation, uh, but something that you didn't expect that they are doing or, or uh, that doesn't match with what you previously thought should happen. Um, and that's uh, part of the analysis product. And when you pull that analysis together and you come up with that nice um, documentation, um, you're going to... Uh, so you're going to give maybe some potential uh, solutions to this or suggestions or recommendations um, or just further discuss these items would be some of those tasks. So tips for success while you're shadowing. Main thing is to zip your lip, <laughs> listen, be a shadow, ask questions, but try not to interrupt too often. Um, let them do their thing, especially the first time they do it. If you're watching this multiple times, watching the process, multiple observations, um, you know, you really want to pay attention to the detail here. And if you have any questions, uh, unless it's really pertinent that you ask them questions at that time, just make a note of it otherwise and ask them later um, so that you don't interrupt their flow. Um, don't suggest possible solutions while you're doing this. I mean, I did that many years ago and found out the hard way. You never, never want to do that because you don't even know. If you can, <laughs> you know don't make promises you can't keep. And uh, it may not be the best suggestion anyway, because there may be a lot of other information that you have to look at. You still have to go through interview process, et cetera. So don't give them any type of possible solutions. If they suggest a solution, you know, note that suggestion, put it down, 
and then gently redirect them back to focus on the details of the problems that they're having, not so much letting them create the solutions because they also may not have all the facts or the best solution. Um, try to remain unbiased. I mean, you want, you want to not be judgmental of, of people. People are having their own issues all the time. They've got a lot of stuff going on. So, you know, try not to come up, you know, right away, put a block on yourself and say, yeah, this person has no idea what they're doing because they may, it just may be the system, you know, doesn't support that. So try to look at it with a very open approach and uh, don't try to interpret the behavior that someone's doing unless you actually confirm it. Somebody may roll their eyes and you're thinking it might be something to do with the process and they may be rolling their eyes because out of the corner of their eye they saw their phone light up or something or maybe they have a cramp or maybe their boyfriend's on the other line you know and you have someone looking over your shoulder type of thing so so don't interrupt behavior without confirming it and that's the tips for success for shadowing or observation otherwise called observation so i hope that was really helpful to everyone well we certainly got to tell some stories <laughs> we did and you do we love to tell those processes stories. with stories but again <laughs> don't share them around anybody wait till you get home and tell your loved one or your best friend or whatever don't talk about it in the office <laughs> that's right or the elevator anywhere the elevator the parking lot even a local lunch place, you never know who's in the booth behind you. you never know. So be selective right. about where you vent your own stress. <laughs> or just tell those funny <laughs> stories. Like I said, we are very careful to not identify anybody. <laughs> that's right. So that, that, uh, that does keep it interesting. So don't forget, um, you can leave us uh, questions and feedback in the comments section here on uh, Facebook. Tweet or DM us on Twitter at the BA Zone, or you can go to our website, thebazone.com, and use our uh, comment form. And please like us and subscribe in all the usual places. Or you can take our three-question survey, and we'll put the link in the post so that's easy to find. And um, that about wraps up our show. Well, uh, we'll be back. Sense. In case you are in the process of this, and maybe you're also looking to do surveys, which is something we've talked about before. We put together a little uh, booklet on, you know, things to keep in mind and guidelines for creating your own surveys, which are also a part of this process. And if you'd like to get your own free copy, uh, you can go to thebazone.com forward slash survey ebook. And you just need to give us your email address so we know where to send it. Um, we're using a, a service and so they require that you verify that you requested it. And once you do that, then you will get the free book. So freebies all around. Yay, thank you, Kathleen, for that. Yeah, that was one of our other top 10 um, requirements analysis and elicitation techniques, along with the document analysis and shadowing. And next week's show, we will, which will appropriately be on Halloween, um, and it's going to be at a different time, actually. It's going to be 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be live, and we'll be talking about brainstorming. How apropos, Abby Normal Brains, yes, for those young Frankenstein lovers. Brainstorming, there will be no zombies Brainstorming. <laughs> <laughs> the show should be spooktacular. <laughs> um, I know, corny. Well, well, we look forward to decorations there. I'm going to have to come up with something for the I know, room. right? Skeleton swinging out front, I tell you. Uh, you have to get a picture so we can show that. I know, I will, I will. I, I was saying earlier in the pre-show, I looked out on my lawn and people were taking selfies with my skeletons earlier. So I'm going to put a cup in one of their hands and try to collect some money with that. But anyway, we look Dick forward to kibble. hearing from you. <laughs> Dick and Skibble. Um, if you click the subscribe button, you'll get notified when we go live. And as always, we're here to help you own the zone of business analysis. And thank you again for coming by. And see you next time on the BA Zone. Bye. <laughs> She's so done with me dancing today. So long, folks. Here's Until a next week. <laughs>